Hey guys, what's up? It's Savannah. Welcome back to my channel and welcome back to another true crime video here on my YouTube channel. As you guys can tell by the title of today's episode, today we are talking about the incredibly twisted case of 19 year old Shannon Melendi. As I was researching this case, it honestly reminded me of a movie. This sounded like a movie plot with how twisted it was. So I'm really, really interested to hear what you guys have to say about it and what your thoughts are on this solved case. So with that being said, let's jump right on into it today. Shannon Denise Melendi was born on October 20th, 1974 in Miami, Florida to her parents, Luis and Yvonne Melendi. Luis was born and raised in Cuba and in 1961, he ended up fleeing from there and traveling to America where he met Yvonne in 1970. Now the two of them started dating and they immediately fell in love. They got married and they had two children, two daughters. They had Shannon and then five years later they had their second daughter named Monique. Louise described Shannon as the type of girl who absolutely loved life and wanted to do anything and everything. She was described as someone who wanted to live life to the fullest. Now Shannon Shannon and her dad were incredibly, incredibly close. They were like two peas in a pod. It was said that Shannon had Luis wrapped around her finger and the two of them had an incredibly close and strong, loving relationship. Shannon's also described as witty and funny and someone that just everyone wanted to be around. Yvonne said that she was a very goal-oriented person and every goal she set, she achieved. Shannon in high school was the president of both her junior and her senior classes at Southwest High School in Florida. Shannon also played soccer and was the captain of the debate team. Now, when Shannon graduated from high school, she ended up moving from Miami, Florida to Atlanta, Georgia, where she attended Emory University. Emory is a private university. It's located in Georgia, and it has a student population of about 7,000 people, so definitely on the smaller scale. And when Shannon attended Emory, she ended up majoring in political science, and she loved her school. She was absolutely in love with Emory. She loved her friends. She loved the environment. She loved the classes that she she was taking. She really was enjoying her time there. And to give you an idea of the type of goal-oriented person that Shannon was, Shannon's goal, her career goal, her lifelong goal was to be a part of the Supreme Court. And her family said with the amount of determination and how smart she was, she 100% would have achieved that goal had this not happened to her. Now, while Shannon was attending Emory University, she ended up getting a part-time job. And this part-time job was at a softball field just a couple miles away from the university campus. The softball field was in DeKalb County and Shannon would go to the softball games. She would go to the softball tournaments. She would keep score. Whatever was needed of her at the softball field is what she would do. And that was no different on March 26th, 1994. Now Shannon got to the softball field at about 8.40 a.m. for her first game. And she actually ended up working overtime this day due to a scheduling conflict. So she she ended up working until about 12.40, so a little past noon. And after her shift ended, Shannon was seen going across the street to the gas station. That way she could pick up a soda before heading back to campus. However, Shannon never made it home that day. It wasn't until the following morning on March 27th that Shannon's roommate, Athena, realized that something was very wrong. Shannon was a very responsible girl. She was a very organized person. She wasn't the type to just disappear without saying saying anything, and for her to not be there throughout the time of Saturday morning to Sunday morning was not like her at all, enough so that Athena actually decided to call Shannon's family. So Athena called Shannon's family. She called her home in Miami, and this is when Monique, Shannon's little sister, answered the phone, and she remembers being asked by Athena if anyone had heard from Shannon or spoke to her in the past 24 hours. According to Monique, she said that she could tell that Athena was very frantic and distraught on the phone on the other line. She knew that something was very wrong, but Monique did have to tell Athena that no one had spoken to Shannon within that time frame. Now, at the time of this phone call, both of Shannon's parents were out at work, and it wasn't until they got off of work that day
day that they were made aware that Shannon was missing. Now, Shannon's family said that the moment that they found out that Shannon was missing, they knew that this was not going to end well. After speaking with Monique, Athena decided the best thing to do would be to go out and actually look for Shannon herself. So her and two of their other friends decided to get in the car and start driving around, and they ended up driving down to the softball field. Now, when they got to the softball field parking lot, they ended up making a wrong turn, which forced them to turn around in a way where they then passed the gas station that Shannon was last seen at, and that is when Athena discovered Shannon's car parked in the gas station parking lot. Shannon drove a black 280SX Nissan car, and when Shannon's car was found, the keys were still in the ignition and the car was un locked. Now, something to know about Shannon is that her car was her pride and joy. She absolutely loved her car. Her family said it was almost like a running joke of how good of care Shannon took of her car. She was always very responsible with it, and she never took it for granted. She would absolutely never leave the keys in the ignition and the car unlocked. So because Athena knew all of that, she knew that finding Shannon's car in this condition was a very, very worrisome and troubling sign, so much so that she decided to call 911. Now, when authorities arrived on the scene, they actually didn't find anything that could have suggested that there was any foul play in regards to Shannon's disappearance. Because there was no blood in the car and there was no sign of a struggle and there really wasn't anything that looked out of the ordinary, police decided the best thing to do would be to have Athena drive the car back to Emory. Now, this is bad for multiple reasons. First being that it completely contaminates any possible evidence that was inside of the car. You're contaminating evidence of a crime scene. Police told Athena to drive the car before taking any possible fingerprints or DNA. So automatically that really does contaminate with the biggest part of the investigation at this point. However, Athena did what authorities said and she drove the car back to Emory. Now, when this investigation started, authorities thought it was very, very possible that Shannon could have just run away. There was no sign of a struggle in the car. There was no blood, no one had seen or heard from her, and she was an adult, so technically she could run away if she wanted to. And at first they were really leaning more towards that theory rather than the second one, which was that she just was abducted in plain sight. However, Shannon's family knew without a shadow of a doubt that Shannon did not run away on her own free will. She did not just up and leave. Her family said she had no reason to run away. She had nothing to run away from. Now, the FBI actually got involved in this case too, and between them and the local authorities, they were searching through all aspects of Shannon's life, trying to see where this went south. Now, they spoke to a lot of her friends, they spoke to people that she dated, and they also looked closely at a trip that Shannon took over spring break, which was just a couple weeks prior to her disappearance. Now, her and a group of her friends all decided to go away for spring break and have a fun vacation together, and one of the people in this group was a man named Chris Goslin. Now, Chris and Shannon had known each other for a couple years at this point, and Chris said that the two of them would hang out while they were on this vacation together. They would sometimes hang out at the beach together. They would go to dinners together, but there was nothing ever romantic between the two of them. They just so happened to be in the same group on the same vacation. However, authorities were very very skeptical of this, and they decided to kind of dig into Chris a little bit more. They would call him while he was at work. They would call him while he was at home. They would show up at his apartment saying that they wanted to ask him questions, all of which he complied with because authorities realized at the end of all of this that Chris was not involved in Shannon's disappearance. Now, after clearing Chris Goslin from the potential list of people of interest, authorities decided to trace Shannon's steps. And when they did this, first of all, they were still very, very convinced that Shannon was a runaway. They still weren't fully convinced that she didn't leave on her own free will. However, what they decided to do was they decided to retrace her steps, and when they did that, they traced them back to the softball field. That was the last known place that she was. Now, something to note about March 26th at this softball field was there was actually a softball competition going on. So this wasn't just your average game. This was a whole tournament. So you had a bunch of people who were at this field. So many people that authorities said that they ended up speaking to about 400 to 500 people 
all that were at this softball field. And when they gave these people their interviews, authorities asked if anything seemed off, if they could remember anything that seemed a little strange or a little off-putting, and they did notice a pattern in multiple people's stories. There were multiple people that said that the umpire of the game was a little strange. They described him as off and not focusing on what he needed to be focusing on, which was the game. And instead of focusing on the game, many people noticed that his focus was off on Shannon. Shannon was situated right behind home plate, which if you know anything about a baseball field, you know that the umpire is typically behind home plate. And Shannon was situated behind the fence of home plate, so they weren't very far from each other. Now, authorities learned that this umpire was named Colvin Hinton, otherwise known as Butch, which is what we will be referring to him as. Butch Hinton was an avid churchgoer. His dad was a pastor, and he worked as an airline maintenance worker for Delta airlines. Now, after learning all of this information about Butch, authorities decided that obviously the next best thing for them to do would be to go and speak with him themselves. So just several days after Shannon's disappearance on April 4th, 1994, authorities made their first visit to speak with Butch. Now, when talking to Butch, he said that he was aware that Shannon had gone missing. He had heard about it. However, he said he had nothing to do with it. He said that he went directly home after the game. And to confirm his story, he actually showed police telephone records because he had made a phone call right when he got home from the game. So because of that, authorities thought that gave him a very narrow time frame. It was very unlikely that Butch had something to do with it because of that. Butch also said that he didn't see anything that was out of the ordinary at the game. Everything seemed completely fine and normal. So because of all of those factors, authorities still really didn't know what to believe here. But then fast forward to about a week after Shannon's disappearance and and this is when everything changed. All right, you guys, you guys have definitely heard me talk about BetterHelp before, and I am here to remind you about it. If you've never heard of BetterHelp before, BetterHelp is an online counseling service that provides you professional counseling in the comfort of your own home. Once you sign up with BetterHelp, you will then be given a short survey that will then match you with a counselor that is best deemed to fit your needs. BetterHelp has counselors that specialize in so many different areas, including anxiety, depression, grief, LGBTQ plus matters, sleeping problems, family problems, relationship problems, and more. If for whatever reason you're matched with a counselor that you don't think is the best fit, you will be able to change your counselor at any time for no additional charge. Once you connect with the counselor, you'll then be able to set up phone or video sessions, and you'll also be able to text your counselor as well. And financial aid is available for those who qualify. And if you guys want to try out BetterHelp today, you can do so by going to betterhelp.com slash instinct. And when you use the code instinct, you will get 10% off your first month using BetterHelp. Again, that is just betterhelp.com slash instinct for 10% off your first month. Betterhelp.com slash instinct. Has there ever been a time where you guys are searching for something online that you wouldn't want others to know about? Personally, for me, when I am searching for gifts for people, for birthdays, anything like that, I do not want anyone being able to see what I have been searching online. And I know most of you are probably thinking, why don't you just use incognito mode? Well, let me tell you something. Incognito mode does not hide your activity. It doesn't matter what mode you use or how many times you clear your browsing history, your internet service provider can still see every single website you've ever visited. That's why even when I'm at home, I never go online without using ExpressVPN. It doesn't matter if you get your internet from Verizon or Comcast or AT&T. ISPs in the U.S. can legally sell your information to ad companies. ExpressVPN is an app that reroutes your internet connection through their secure servers so your ISP can't see the sites you visit. ExpressVPN also keeps all of your information secure by encrypting 100% of data with the most powerful encryption available. Most of the time, I don't even realize I have ExpressVPN on. It runs seamlessly in the background and is so easy to use. All you have to do is tap one button and you're protected. ExpressVPN is available on all your devices, phones, computers, even your smart TV. So there's no excuse for you to not be using it. Protect your online activity today with the VPN rated number one by CNET and Wired. Visit my exclusive link, expressvpn.com slash killer, and you can get an extra three months free 
for a one-year package. That's expressvpn.com slash killer. Expressvpn.com slash killer to learn more. Now, I don't know about you, but over the course of the pandemic, my definition of comfort definitely changed. I traded in my jeans for sweatpants and leggings, and honestly, I cannot even tell you the last time I wore heels. Now, as things slowly approach normal life, one thing I'm bringing with me is comfort. I know I can still be comfortable in a bra thanks to Harper Wild. Harper Wild makes bras that put comfort first. Their collection of quality basics includes the base, which is a lightly lined everyday bra in a range of nudes that won't show through your shirt, and the bliss. That's a bralette that provides lift while feeling like second skin. My favorite bra is their base bra. It's an amazing staple to have, as well as their lounge bra. It's a comfortable bralette that you can can wear anywhere. Plus, with an easy interactive fit quiz, beautifully priced bundles, and free returns, they've made the act of shopping for bras absolutely painless. You can even get a handy bra recycling kit with your purchase so you can say goodbye to your old bras sustainably. Harper Wild makes everything about bras better. Stay in your comfort zone. Go to harperwild.com slash killer today so you can get 20% off your first purchase because the only thing better than a comfortable bra is getting a discount just for being a Killer Instinct listener. That's 20% off at harperwild.com slash killer. Harperwild.com slash killer killer. Did you guys know that 80% of the immune system is influenced by the gut or that supporting the immune system through proper diet and digestive health enables pets to help better fight environmental allergies? Solid Gold is passionate about gut health because a healthy digestive system positively impacts the immune system and overall wellness of pets. Solid Gold was the first holistic pet food company in America, started in 1974 by Sissy McGill. You guys, Sissy was an absolute trailblazer and pioneer who disrupted a male-dominated industry and created a natural pet food before it was cool. Solid Gold's nutritional platform is inspired by their founding belief that high-quality food is the best way to impact our pet's mind, body, and spirit. I'll have you guys know my dog recently got extremely sick and it really made me look at the ingredients and the type of food that I was giving him. I ended up switching him over to solid gold and he felt so much better. I could just tell in his overall personality when I would give him the solid gold food, he wasn't as tired. His personality was more alive and he just seemed overall so much better. So it really had me interested in the type of products that we feed our pets and how important it is to feed them good, wholesome products. Solid Gold's foods are different because they cleanse the digestive system with whole superfoods, balance with living probiotics, and fuel with omega-3 and 6 fatty acids supporting gut health and nourishing your pet inside and out. Right now, save 30% on Solid Gold products by going to solidgoldpet.com slash killer. That's solidgoldpet.com slash killer to save 30% on select Solid Gold products. Remember, that is just solidgoldpet.com slash killer. Now, there was actually a phone call that came in to the Emory Counseling Center, and a woman who was working at the front desk had actually answered the phone. Now, when the woman answered the phone, there was a man on the other line of the call, and this man asked the woman if he was aware of the Shannon Melendi case. Now, apparently this woman said that she was not aware of the case, which I'm not sure if she genuinely did not know or if she was just playing along. However, she told the man that she was not aware of the case and she also asked him to explain why he was calling. And this is when the man told the woman on the other end of the line that he kidnapped Shannon. He said that he quote unquote had Shannon and that she was alive and healthy. And he also said that he would keep her until he was through with her. And when he was through with her, he would release her. He said to prove that he was the one that had Shannon, he was going to leave a piece of Shannon's jewelry at the phone booth that he was at that police could find. That way they would know that he was being serious about this. And then he hung up the phone. Now what's very interesting about this phone call is that whoever was on the other end of the line did not request anything. They didn't ask for ransom money. They didn't say they wanted the investigation to stop. They didn't request 
anything. They just simply wanted to state that they had kidnapped Shannon. And they weren't even saying it to say, and this is my identity too, so they could figure out who did it. They were simply just wanting the police to run in circles around this. Now, as you can imagine, this phone call turned this case upside down completely. And when it came to Shannon's family, they said that when this phone call happened, there was a sense of relief, surprisingly. And the relief came from the fact that they knew that at this point, police could not say that it was a possibility that Shannon ran away. They knew at this point that authorities would have to believe that she was abducted. So after this phone call, the FBI traced the call back to a telephone booth. And when they arrived at the telephone booth, they found a tiny cloth bag. And inside of this cloth bag was a ring that did in fact belong to Shannon. It was a turquoise ring. It was one that she wore all the time. I believe it was given to her by her godmother. And apparently she wore it every single day. And her family was able to quickly confirm that that was Shannon's. Now, along with relief, what this phone call also brought to Shannon's family was a sense of hope because they thought with the way that the caller was describing the situation, it was a good possibility that Shannon might possibly still be alive. The person on the other end of the line said she was alive, said she was healthy. And at this point, Shannon's family was just waiting for another phone call. They thought it was very possible that whoever did this was going to call back and request ransom money. However, that second phone call never came. And while authorities were trying to deal with the phone call situation, they didn't want to put a pause on the rest of their investigation. So they actually got a warrant to search through Butch Hinton's house. Police searched all throughout the home and they also brought in cadaver dogs. However, they did not find any sign that Shannon was ever there. Now, even though there was no sign that Shannon was ever at Butch's house, there was a very big red flag that came up to authorities. When authorities dug up behind Butch's house, they actually found multiple pieces of women's clothing, as well as women's shoes, a sleeping bag, and a club scoreboard card. So just weirdly enough, all of those items were buried in Butch's backyard without any real explanation. However, none of those items belonged to Shannon. So while authorities did find something that was off-putting, it didn't really help them in their investigation. Now, at this point, authorities also went back and looked at Shannon's car, and there was a forensics team that ran through the car. Mind you, again, this was after Athena had already driven it, so it was contaminated. But what the forensics team found was that someone had actually wiped down the car, meaning that more than likely whoever was responsible for this made an effort to clean the car. That way there would be no traceable DNA. So now we're five months into Shannon's disappearance. There is still no sign of Shannon. However, there are flyers for her hanging up everywhere. Everyone is doing everything they can to find Shannon. And at this point, about five months into the disappearance, like I said, Yvonne ended up getting a phone call from one of her friends. And when she answered the phone, her friend told her that Butch Hinton's house was actually on fire. It was on fire and it completely burned to the ground. Now, Butch claimed that this fire was the result of a faulty vacuum cleaner. However, after looking more into it, authorities were convinced that Butch deliberately set his house on fire. That way he could claim insurance money on it. So because of that, he was actually arrested and charged with fraud. And when he was sentenced, he was sentenced to nine years in prison. Now, when it came to Shannon's family and when they heard about Butch's house fire, they thought that the motive for the fire more than likely was to get rid of any potential evidence that Shannon was ever there. He knew that the police were on him. They knew that they were looking through his house and he wanted to be able to get rid of any possible evidence. And they believe that's why he set the fire. So now we fast forward completely to almost the end of Butch's prison sentence. So almost nine years and authorities were doing everything they could to close Shannon's case and not have Butch back out on the streets. So in order to do this, authorities brought a new prosecutor onto the team and they started looking through all the old files again. And when they did, they realized that Butch actually had a criminal record way before Shannon's disappearance and way before the fire and what it was for might shock you. In 1982, a 14-year-old girl named Tammy Singleton was living with her family in Illinois. Now, one day she got a phone
phone call from her ex-boyfriend's brother, who, mind you, was 22 years old at the time. He asked Tammy to meet up with him, which she agreed to do, saying that the only reason she agreed to this is because she believed her ex-boyfriend was going to be there. However, Tammy was very surprised when the older brother showed up and her ex-boyfriend was not in the car with him. Tammy ended up getting in the car with him, and that's when the brother told her that he had a gift to give her from her ex-boyfriend. He ended up pulling out a ring and placed it on her finger, and then things turned very weird very fast because afterwards, the brother basically asked Tammy to put her hands together, and that is when he tied her hands behind her back and he whipped out a knife and put it to her neck. He said to Tammy that if she didn't cooperate with what he said, he was going to use the knife on her. Now, as you've probably been able to guess, the brother of Tammy's ex-boyfriend is Butch Hinton. Tammy said that Butch said things like, quote unquote, if you don't do what I say, I'll do to you like what I did to the last two. And he ended up duct taping her mouth and putting her in the trunk of his car. After he did that, he started driving around aimlessly for a little bit before he ended up taking her back to his house that he shared with his wife. And he ended up carrying Tammy through the cellar of his home without being seen and put her in the basement. At this point, Butch sexually assaulted Tammy and afterwards he left Tammy in the basement, handcuffed and with duct tape over her mouth. Now, at some point, Tammy said that she ended up hearing Butch's wife upstairs, and she tried to make as much noise as possible to get his wife to hear that someone was down there. Now, in order to block his wife from seeing what was going on, Butch ended up running down to the basement and punched Tammy in the face. And even Tammy says she doesn't really know how this happened. However, when Butch punched her in the face, she was actually a able to bite his finger. And when she did that, he ended up screaming, which got the attention of his wife. And she ended up running into the basement and was horrified to see what was going on. His wife ended up calling the police on Butch and Butch was arrested and charged with kidnapping and indecent liberties with a child. Now, Butch ended up pleading guilty, but he also pled insanity. He was given a four-year sentence. However, he only served 21 months of it. And after that, he was a free man. And he basically went on to start a whole new life. He ended up divorcing his wife and he moved to Atlanta, Georgia. Now, how this wasn't picked up on right when Shannon went missing is beyond me. I have no idea how no one picked up on this prior. However, when prosecution did find this out, this obviously helped authorities build a very, very strong case against Butch. Now, Butch was released from prison off the insurance fire case in 2003, and it took police a couple months after that for them to build a case against him. Now, the prosecution learned that the day of Shannon's disappearance, Butch had borrowed his father's butcher saw. Butch's neighbors also complained that on the night of the 26th, Butch was in his backyard burning trash. Now, that along with everything else led up to Butch Hinton being arrested in August of 2004 for the murder and kidnapping of Shannon and Melendi. Now, Butch pled not guilty, and this was a very, very hard case from a prosecution angle because they didn't have a body. They were charging Butch with murder without any physical proof that Shannon was dead, and that is a very, very, very hard task for a prosecutor to have to accomplish because it's very easy for the defense to come back and say that, you know, this person didn't do it because there's no body, so how do we even know that they're dead? That's the angle that the defense was taking. However, the prosecution did have some leverage here. They ended up speaking to some of the inmates that shared a cell with Butch. And when they did that, they learned that one night while Butch and his cellmate were sleeping, Butch woke up in the middle of the night and screamed, I didn't do this. The demon inside of me killed that girl. Now, along with that quote directly from Butch, Tammy Singleton also testified against Butch as well. The prosecution also brought in that that small cloth bag that was found at the telephone booth that the phone call was made from that held Shannon's ring inside of it. Now, while the ring belonged to Shannon, the cloth bag did not. Authorities figured out that these cloth bags were manufactured from a small business in Richmond, Virginia, and this company supplied the bags through a middleman to only one client in Georgia, and that client was Delta 
Airlines, the same airline company that Butch worked for. And when authorities showed up to Butch's office and looked through his desk, they found multiple of those cloth bags sitting on his desk. Now, once the trial was all said and done, the jury deliberated for three days before finding Butch Hinton guilty and sentenced him to life in prison. But here is where things get a little tricky. Now, because Shannon's disappearance and murder happened in 1994, the parole regulations were a lot less strict back then, and because of that, Butch is eligible for parole every seven years. He has already been denied parole twice, and his next parole consideration date will be in February of 2025. Now, Shannon's family is not giving up. They are fighting tooth and nail to keep Butch off the street and in prison for the rest of his life for what he did to Shannon. And along with that, Shannon's family and authorities believe there is a very big possibility that Shannon and Tammy were not the only victims of Butch Hinton. With all the random women's clothing that was found in his backyard, a Authorities believe that there are multiple more victims of his out there that they just haven't linked together yet. Now, when it comes to Shannon, her body has never been found. However, in 2006, Butch Hinton actually confessed to her murder. He claimed that he abducted her from the gas station and said that he lured her to his car and forced her to drive him home and then raped her twice at knife point before strangling her. Butch said that she didn't put up a fight at all because he told her that he would let her go and Shannon believed him. However, he ended up strangling her to death on the early morning hours of March 27th, 1994. Now, Butch said he ended up strangling her with a tie while Shannon was already asleep and that everything happened very quickly. Now, what this also means, what this confession also means is that when Butch called the Emory Counseling Center saying that he had Shannon and that he was gonna let her go, that was all a lie. Shannon was already dead at that point. He was simply just taunting the police because he wanted to get some sort of rise and reaction out of them. Butch is currently incarcerated at the Hayes State Prison in Underwood Drive, and I I think this case is super important because Butch needs to stay in prison for the rest of his life. For everyone's safety, this man does not need to be out on the streets. The fact that that is even up for negotiation is beyond me, but since we're already there, I think it should be very clear that Butch needs to be in prison for the rest of his life. But I am very interested to hear what you guys have to say about this. All right, you guys, that is gonna be all for me today. Thank you so much for tuning in to another true crime video here on my YouTube channel. If you're new here, hi, my name's Savannah. I make videos a couple times a week. You should subscribe and join the family. I love you guys so much, and I'll see you next week with a brand new one. Bye, guys.